what I did, I made my first novel, in fact. My father, he said, you should try. Try, sit down, good advice, first you go to the loo. <laughs> Piss first, then you can sit forever. No drinks on the table, and I, I, I never do, I never do. So uh, I wrote a, a story called The Illustrated, no I did not. It was called Russian uh, um, Kabali. I don't know how to translate that. And I wrote the whole book and it was terrible. <laughs> Not bad written. No, no, no. no, no, no. Right. It, was, it was terrible because it was all about uh, the period of uh, Khmer Rouge in yeah. Cambodia. Lord Khmer. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. And, uh, and then Idi Amin Suganda. Okay. So it was very, very harsh. Yeah. And I, I, a comic book, very, no. very humorous. No, no, not at all. <laughs> and I never wanted to have it published. It's still in my cupboard at home. Okay. So uh, you will never read that. But I wrote that in Schiedam. But what brought you to Schiedam? Schiedam, I knew a, a guy oh. who had a flat. Oh. And he was working for Disney in the United States. So I just borrowed it. Uh. Yes, that's it. Okay. So. But we're standing up for you because uh, hopefully we had an audience and we did, and thank you for that. Yes, that's very good. Okay, before we start with the interview, we have to uh, uh, get to the breaking news. How do the people in Denmark look at the war in Ukraine? Exactly the same way as you do here. Uh, I have a son, he's 32 years old, and I had to excuse him that I'm going down here because an analyst the day before yesterday in Denmark said they are going to throw an, an, an atom bomb and they are going to throw it in the North Sea between Denmark and England. But we're living in Sealand, that's another place of Denmark, so we don't mind. But our <laughs> friends in Jutland, my God, and especially my friends down here, you know, Eichmere will be like, but, uh, so we cross our fingers, and he was very, very annoyed by... We haven't heard this rumor. No, but it's not a rumor. It's uh, an analyst, you know. Sometimes it's true and not. But not to kid about it, uh, I, I wondered, where can you go? Now I went to Amsterdam. That's a bit of the way to South America. Mm. Um, hopefully we think that uh, the plan C will work now. The plan C is that uh, Putin realizes that the only thing he can get was the two regions and the Krim. And if they can deal upon that, let's see what the Ukrainian says about that. Mm -hmm. But it's terrible and I, I never expected, you know, stuff like that. But I have to say an excuse that the general secretary of NATO, the former one, he was our former prime minister, and he's a shithole. He's so extremely liberal and dumb, and I think the whole discussion about taking in Ukraine in NATO was his responsibility. Mm. And I hated him. What's Even his name before. again? What's his name again? His name is uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen. Yeah. So. Uh, do we have to talk about that? No. No, no but I'm uh, just curious. Yeah. And then it is uh, one disaster after another. Of course, how did you get through the COVID-17 or 19? Uh... Well, I was in uh, Barcelona, where I live in the wintertime, uh, writing. And uh, the 29th of February, 2020, yeah. I was going home together with my wife just to be sick the 1st of March. That was 10 days before we knew of the, the, the illness yeah. in Denmark. So we laid the whole March, you know, no, not knowing what the hell was going on. <laughs> and uh, we, we phoned, you know, doctors and they said, do you have any fever? And I had to say, well, I never have fever. Then you're not sick. <laughs> That's it. And they never examined us. Later, is it safe? No. <laughs> And later, it was in uh, this November 2021, we were sick again. Yeah. We take it all. And did you get your booster? Yes, yes, 
And yeah. I said, don't you worry, we have the boost and everything, and yeah. Yeah. PCR tests and whatever. Yeah. Would you like to stand up during the whole conversation, or would you like to sit down? Can you feel what he needs? <laughs> okay, we're okay. sitting Let's down. start off with your remarks. But we're still here. Yeah, let's start off with your remarks. Hello, down there. <laughs> your remarkable youth. Yeah. Your father. Yeah. He was a doctor. He yeah, was a, he was a doctor, and, and you grew up in the areas of the mental hospitals, several. Oh yeah, that's okay. why. Yeah. Now yeah. all the explanations of this is I was brought up in mental hospitals. <laughs> Tell me a bit about it. Well, the first time uh, my father, he was uh, a reserve doctor, was in '55. Now you can try to count how old I am now. I was five years old. Yeah, yeah. Can you? Clever guys. And uh, at that period, according to mental office, uh, mental patients, we didn't have anything to do really. You could give them lobotomy and you could uh, give them electroshock, you could strap them down and you could drop them down but not really meet the patients. And in this first hospital where I lived, together with a lot of other kids and you know, employees, nurses, doctors and so forth, lots of patients. Uh, it was uh, in the springtime, the time where women were in cages and men were in cages, screaming. We call it the screaming cages, out, outdoor. Uh, and I very often went down there uh, alone, five years old, and looked upon them, tried not to be spitted on, and went home to my family and my father and asked what happened to them. Why, why, why are they like that? Will I be like that when I'm grown up? And my father said, you know, many of those are having hard times in growing up, yes. And it's hard to grow up, actually. But don't you worry, my dear, because you're on safe grounds. You have a, a wonderful family. Uh, and in so many ways, uh, love is around you. So uh, don't you fear that? And I believe it. God sei Dank. So uh, the next year, in 56, we moved to another hospital. My father was going up, up, up in degrees very fast. And there, his name was Henry, right? Of course, it was Henry Olsen. Yeah. Like me, Carl, Waldemar, Jussi, Henry, Adler, Olsen. That's me. So, um, Henry. <laughs> this year, in 56, there were psychopharmacas. And psychopharmaca changed everything. Suddenly you could understand some of the patients better and you could see into their souls and minds. And my best friend, their friend, was an insane patient called Merck. Merck, he was a killer. He killed his wife and it was a fight between men and wives. And I asked my father about it, and he said, well, it was like, you know, it was, it was an accident, simply. Yeah, but why, 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 why is he here? He became really insane after doing this, because he didn't mean to. So, but is he evil? Well, that depends, but not for the moment, he said. So you can easily talk to him and, and be with him. And I was every day with uh, Merck. He gave me a kitchen, you know, and he, he brought us the food from the central uh, kitchen. And I could see him on the top of the hill coming down with all, you know, all the stuff in it. Sauce, potatoes, vegetables, meat. I could see on his face in a distance of 300 meters whether I liked the food or not. <laughs> because he was so happy when it was meatballs, he was dancing down to me, but when it was liver or heart or something, oh my God, I could see it. <laughs> this Merck, uh, I loved him intensely, and uh, from a very early start, I knew that any person can have in his head evil and good behaving. So, and that's what, that's what we are seeing, uh, suddenly, uh, the Balkan war here now, Russian and Ukrainian and many murders are like you know shocked by their own deeds we followed 
my father from here and there into hospital and hospital. And uh, he was also a head doctor uh, for many years, so high up in Jutland that we didn't have anything but no television, washing machines. We had nothing in a brand new hospital, no refrigerator, you know. So it was like going back in the Middle Age and the most wonderful time of my life. Because of a hundred very dear friends I had, same age as me, from the nurses and doctors. We were a fantastic football team. <laughs> we could even beat, you know, the guys in the city that actually had a trainer. We didn't mind, we just beat them up. And uh, it made me, what I am today, a part of the old-fashioned Jutland called Vinsusl. I'm a Vindelbo, and if I say that in Denmark, they say, really? Yeah, I am. I'm, you know, I'm easygoing. Ah, laid back. Not laid back, but I'm just easygoing. Laid back means you're lazy. <laughs> I am as well, but yes. uh, that's another thing. Yeah. Can you tell me how it ended with your friend, the guy who brought food? Did you know what happened to him? Oh my God, uh, he stayed in mental hospital throughout all his life. And uh, I lost track of him uh, some few years later, and he died when he was 67, I guess. So he had a miserable life. And he died from sorrow. I asked my father, I was in, at that time, I was maybe 10 years old, 12. Did he commit suicide? No. He just sat in his chair and he died. So, in this next mental hospital, that was crazy, because I knew so many patients, and uh, they died, of course, from age, many of them or whatever. And it was interesting because every day my family discussed somatic issues. That means illness, what's in you, the guts, <laughs> uh, everything. It's so interesting. Yeah. Even though we took a chicken one day, and took the wing of the chicken and said, even though it's prepared, you can do like this. And then it did like this. So this was my childhood. And when a person died there, when a person died there, uh, there was a little prairie wagon yeah. coming down the street with a dead person. We knew, me and a friend, now it's in pure time that we run down to the place where the aut autopsy will take place. It was a, a small house and there was a window at the, the top so we could climb the trees oh, yeah. and lie on the roof <laughs> yeah. and look down oh, yeah. and see some trepanations or <laughs> uh, autopsies. And for me, the first time was a little scary, yeah. but you know, you're not bleeding when you're having the autopsy, so it was not a mess. And it was, for me, it was very interesting to see the persons I actually knew alive how they looked inside. So maybe that was why I later on uh, started medicine for a while. <laughs> but I realized when I started medicine, oh, come on. Now you will never leave the hospital in your life. I mean, it's like uh, being a student and then suddenly you're a teacher. Doesn't make any sense. And my father, are you teachers here? I Thank to, you. I used to be a teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, but for me, it didn't make any sense because I could clearly feel that uh, the hierarchy in the hospitals was not my case. I hate it, in fact. And all my books are about misuse of power. This big sense, like Berlusconi and Putin and, you know, Trump. And in the smaller sense, within colleagues and mopping and family, when you're not treating one person good, uh, I hate mi misuse of power. And I saw very early in my life that persons that I could really not trust was the doctors in the mental hospitals. In 55, they experimented all the time, you know, with the patients. And uh, 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 what? Uh, the Jack Nicholson film. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah, but I have to admit, uh, I started movies later on, and I saw this one flew over the uh, 
cuckoo's nest. Yes. And what, what, how did I react, do you think? I laughed throughout the movie because it was such a big theater. Lovely, lovely actors. And, but the script, I mean, uh, I couldn't recognize any of the real life in mental hospitals there. So, uh, but you didn't twist doctors. No. But your father was a doctor. He was a controversial and was, doctor. And he was the guy who gave you the best advice of your life. Yes, it's true. That oh was, my God. Yeah. Shall I tell that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, in, in 68, I was 18 years old. And you must realize, you young guys, that uh, everything happened there. Everything. The riots, the revolutions, the leftist wings, and the music was fantastic. And especially a guy like Jimi Hendrix influenced me very much. So we made a band, school kids and I, and we were good. So uh, we, uh, well, we were on stage many times a week, but never in school. And then they flopped me in the second degree in the gymnasium. You haven't been here. Yeah, but let me let me have an exam in every 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 part. No, no, no. We have to give an example. You are flopping this second year. I went home to my father, and you must know that he was the best educated man ever made in Denmark because he had five uh, main degrees in university and yeah, and a lot of us and conductor from the conservatory and so forth. So I was a little ashamed, you can imagine that. Very ashamed. How can they flop me, Father? I, I still believed I was the wisest guy in the school. And my father said, he laughed. He said, yeah, but you know. Didn't you, uh, didn't you learn to play a good guitar throughout the year? Yeah. So what's to complain about? Now you have to take the next two years and do better. Okay, but... Listen, you see, you are a talented guy. I saw that very early. You have many talents. Could you do me the favor in your life to pursue all your talents one by one and be lucky about it? This, this would be, have been the life I would have loved to live. So could you try to live that? He said, well, you have to earn money too. Yeah, 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 he said, but you know, you have the biggest talent of all. You're lucky. Thank you, I said. And then I understood that luck is very difficult to obtain. You have to search for it and work for it. But uh, he saved me there, sort of. And that is the explanation why I made so many things in my life. And I was 47 before I really began to write. So thank you, Papa. Yes, we had a comic book store. Yeah. He was uh, the coordinator of the anti-cruise missile uh, action in Denmark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 the music career didn't go anywhere. No, but uh, <laughs> I, I composed music for oh, yeah. movies. You did uh, uh, scores for films. Yeah. yeah. And then I had my own publishing house. Yeah, publisher. And then I, started up, yeah. then I started up writing The Alphabet House. Yeah. That was in 87 or something. Has any one of you read The Alphabet House? That Alphabet House? Oh. Thank you to you. Isn't it swell? <laughs> it's maybe the best I ever made. And that was my debut. Mm. Buy it. It's fantastic. No. Uh, but not really, it, not really your debut, because the, the, the missing link still Yeah, skidded. the missing link was my debut, but you know, skidded. not his debut. Well, okay. Did you uh, know after your death also? No, 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 no. Did I, you destroy I it? it? I, yeah, my, my, the one who's going to inherit me promised me not to let it go. Um, no, I'm not destroying it, no. no. Um, and did, did you know that you had it in you to become a, a, a thriller writer? A thriller writer? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I knew that there are a lot of discussions about that, but the thriller book is the only real mainstream book. Really? Huh. Yes, it is. <laughs> Think of the Bible, for instance. What about Abraham? Would he kill Isaac or not? See, that's the main element of a thriller. It's not to solve a crime. It's a 
it's to prevent the crime to happen in the end. That's a thriller. Yeah. And you can you can have suspense and point of views, very important. But that's a thriller. And think about Moses. He came to the Red Sea and Pharaoh, he was just there. What would happen? This is a thriller. Now it was a little strange thriller here because of the Red Sea opened up. But anyway, <laughs> and uh, if you think about Alexander Dumas, for instance, Count of Monte Cristo, what's this all about? It's all about injustice. And it's all about a person who doesn't know why he has been imprisoned for so many years. And it's all about revenge. So will he revenge in the end? That's a thriller. So the thriller is the main. And out on the outskirts, we have poetry here, and we have Roman stuff here, and standard literature, and so forth. And the thriller is wonderful if you combine it, I mean, with the crime aspects. Now, in crime aspects, you can have a crime. And you can try to solve the crime if you want to. And in the end, you can try to prevent another crime to happen. So, therefore, all my books in Denmark are called crime thrillers. Thank you. So, uh, but your favorite, all-time favorite book is Oliver Twist. Yeah, it was very strange. Do any one of you have read uh, The Marco Effect? I had a review, and it was all about... It, 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 I feel like, you know, uh, that Sola, he is actually the main character in, in Oliver Twist. Could that be? And I feel that uh, Marco is Oliver. So did he make a Fakin and an Oliver into a Marco and Zola? I think so. And I was like, oh my God. Because my main aim is to think that I'm original. <laughs> and therefore, I never read any other, thriller. other thrillers or in my genre at all. It hasn't done that for 15 years. Uh, and I'm asking my friends who are reading everything, the new book here, the manuscript, is it original enough or can you see, see uh, I mean, something from another book? And one is lying always and saying, no, no, it's totally original. So I believe that. <laughs> but I have to admit that Oliver Twist is my favorite book of all. And I love Charles Dickens very much, as well as John Steinbeck and so. Uh, people who are blending in uh, into sort of crimes, political issues, social issues, and even romance and so forth. So, and I didn't know I was copying Oliver Twist, so. Now I'm reflecting a little more, yeah. Okay, about your main character. Mr. Milk, Carl Milk. Could you describe him for us? <laughs> no. You know, you know, for every reader, there's another Karl Mörk. Oh, yeah. And we have to realize that if we see some of the movies. It's not your Karl Mörk. It's not mine Karl Mörk. But give us your Karl Mörk. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a production company's Karl Mörk, and that's it. Karl Mörk, he is the kind of police officer who's not al alcoholic, and he's not, uh, he's not weird. He's just fed up of his work. And if you ask any police officers, how is it to deal with criminal persons throughout 30 years? How do you feel about it? And they are all fed up <laughs> by it. That's Karl Merck. Karl Merck is a big guy. And uh, uh, I think that he's coming from Vetsus like I did. So a part of his character is that he's lean back, lazy, uh, and uh, always in opposition, and that's nice, it's sort of me too, uh, always in opposition to something, not my wife, my God, and not to my friends, and not to my audience, but everyone else <laughs> I'm in opposition to, okay. and um, Karl Merck is also a little stubborn, and uh, not that humorous. So I had to invent a humorous character. And that's a sidekick. That's a sidekick. Yes. And uh, you know from Sancho Pancha and Don Quixote and Sherlock Holmes, you know, Watson. with Watson, 
that the interesting person is actually the sidekick. Yeah. The most boring person in the literature is Sherlock Holmes, but what's his funny? So I, I invented a sidekick who was funny, but to all of us, we have to admit that the most important part of every human being is our secrets. The secrets turn us into what we are. The secrets, the things we don't say aloud and don't think aloud, makes us who we are. And it's very important for every person to have part of the secrets. It can be in any way a secret. It can be, be uh, scars from childhood, it can be a sexual character, it can be uh, frustration or whatever. Things you don't want to say. It's uh, really film noir, this. Yes. And have to have a person like Assad with secrets, to have a person like Kalmer with secrets, secrets, makes an endlessly combination of how they can cooperate. So it was important for me to invent this Syrian coming from the most peaceful country in the Middle East when I invented the series in 2005. I must say it changed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I just took the name Assad, you know, yeah. uh, and suddenly I, I, I regretted it really. Yeah. But it was the only name I knew of Syria, so that's it. Anyway, so Carl leads this uh, cold case team. It is a cold case yeah, team. Yeah, they work in the cellar. Thank you. The other, other people uh, don't really uh, take them seriously, but uh, we have nine episodes now. Yeah. And uh, the audience, uh, is there anyone who has read them all? Okay. I love you <laughs> so dearly. I do, I do. All nine of them? Then you know, of course, it's one story. Yes. Starts up with number one and ends up with number ten next year. So. Uh, What's the next? It's all the day then, eh? Very nice. Yeah, it would be nice. Yeah. But you know, it was a project of mine, and I, I, I had been made free thrillers before that international standalones. Yeah, yeah. One is taking place here in, 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 in the Netherlands and in Indonesia, and I'm very happy about that. It's called in Dutch Hit the Life's Terrorist, I think. I love it very dearly, but that's another thing. But I was asked from my new Danish publisher. I, we heard something about about a series. What is that? I explained them to them. My agent said, you should make the story about China. I made 150 pages of that. But my publishing agency in Denmark said, make the series. It will be the longest ever made in the world of one story. We are not talking about Siminong and Macre and Agatha Christie because it's not one story, it's many stories. Yeah, was it always the intention to do ten parts? Yes, it was. And it's not that you, you wrote sort of three, say, and it's... No, not... come on, come oh, yeah, on, Rob, yeah. I'm not lying to you. Okay. But in 2005, I made ten stories. It took me half a year. Huh. So I knew uh, all the aspects, all the themes from one story to another, and then I just had to write it. <laughs> and I thought it would take ten years. That was my aim. In, in the beginning, it, it was fine. One per year, but later on, you know, I swapped, you know, I shopped my freedom of writing and being a human being for success. <laughs> Suddenly I had to travel around in the world and uh, more than 15 publishing houses, 42 languages, mm. meant that I had to travel more than 130 days a year. And it was funny the first years, <coughs> not all of the years, so, and it took away a lot of writing time, so that's why suddenly it took maybe, yeah, what's 14, 15 years to make this series. Yes, but uh, uh, for a reader, say you, you step in at uh, episode four, it wouldn't make any sense, right? Yes, yes, you can do that, you can oh. do that, you can do, if you really insist, you can do that, of course you can. <laughs> Because every story is a story in itself. Yeah. There will be a development for the main characters. You maybe are scratching the behind yeah. here and say, yeah. whatever happened here. Maybe it can make you curious and go back and say, oh, that's why. But it's not, it's not uh, crucial. Okay. So uh, next year, I'm going to make number 10. I'm writing on that now. 
normally I'm also writing always in real time. That means we had a lot of COVID here. And uh, when it snows on a specific day in my books, it really snows. Oh. And uh, if you're cold on that day, it's well. Okay. So you can rely on that. Now I have a problem because I end up this story here like the second Christmas day in 2021. Yeah. And my aim was to go further on from there and work myself throughout a few months. And now we have this war. What can I do about that? Um. Can I jump from one point to another just suddenly? Not really. I have a problem. Putin, I hate you. <laughs> well, you can put on, turn on the television at the police station and I look at it every once in a while. For starters. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Swell idea. Never seen before. Huh? Right. Um, you, have to, you have to reflect a little further than seeing in, in television. You know, very often in a thriller or in a crime story, when you can't solve it, Suddenly you run around the corner and there's a person who can solve everything for you. Very occidental. And I don't like that. So, no, no, no. I think I have to. But anyway, you know, my readers are clever. Most readers are clever. When I start at a scene point A and must explain from A to F, I'm not going through B, C, D and E to come to F because readers today, seeing so many movies, reading so much, they can fill in themselves. Yeah. It's the same with uh, movies nowadays. Absolutely yeah. not only nowadays, they did yeah. for yeah. years and years, yeah. but it's a trick from the movies of course. And uh, I realized, I was a publisher myself, that the most important thing to write for readers is that you respect them and to respect the readers you have to give them the, the opportunity of making some of them the story themselves so not to be too detailed uh, i'm talking about the missing link in a story that's you and the missing link in music that's when when you have beethoven here with hundreds of notes and you have mozart here with Purely nothing. That's Mozart. And you can hum along with Mozart. It's because he knew, he knew of the missing link, the missing tones, notes were important. And if you see a painting, for instance, I love Rembrandt, but he's very detailed, you must admit. And you can you can you can learn a lot from him. But are you disappearing? Sometimes you can be that in a simple, simple painting. That's a missing link. And the missing link here in the stories is you. So not being detailed. The receiving end, so to say. Yeah. And it's, it's a gift for you because now you are partly the boss of the reading. Except for in the evening when you lie in your bed. Now I'm the boss again. Normally, the former years, it was always women I was in bed with and that was nice. Because uh, I, I thought how they were interacting with the stories. And I start up after a few pages, because you want to sleep, simply, men and women. After a few pages, five pages, that's what you're, that's the quote. Then I give you a small sentence. So this is a sentence, which is a cliffhanger. Poor you because now you have to read another page. <laughs> After one page, Asat is entering the scene and he's humorous, he's giving you a joke or a misunderstanding. Suddenly you begin to laugh just a little, but it's enough because when you just laugh two, three seconds, you are pushing a lot of dopamines into your body and with both dopamines in your body, you can't sleep for half an hour. <laughs> Now I've got you. <laughs> so, half an hour means one page first, now 25 pages from the laughing and the dopamine. What to do when you're really ready for the sleep? I give you the murder. <laughs> so, it takes a long 
time before you're ready again. And then I give you the ticker and the funny part and then another harsh deed. So if I can keep you awake for one night and not going to work the next day, I'm a success. So that's <laughs> what I'm trying to do. Do you make a schedule for yourself before no, you start? Not writing? really, but you know, you have it. You have it on the back, you know, while yeah. you're writing. Ho, ho, ho. No. Now I teach you a little. Bit. Oh, yeah. do you laugh at your own jokes? Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh. Actually, I cried two times oh. uh, while I was writing. Just. In uh, one part uh, in the third book, Flashapost. What is it called in, in, in Dutch? Flashapost. 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 Okay. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. Mess message in a bottle. Message in a bottle from P. It's called in Danish. Yeah. There is a person coming from uh, a specific religious sect, and he has thrown his son away because he didn't believe the sect. The son and another son has been kidnapped and he hasn't heard from them for a long, long period. Now he's really worried. We know that the message in the bottle is coming from the two kids and the two kids don't live anymore. So to solve this crime, Karl Merck, Asad and the help of Rose, they are making a big poster on the wall. And it's not yet finished because they couldn't read anything, uh, everything. But then they invite this person, the father, to see whatever happened to the son. And then the father takes the finger on each letter to feel close to the son who's not living anymore. And I was so moved, you know, by the scene, I just cried. And uh, I tried it once more in another part of uh, one of the books. And it, it's a joy, you know, suddenly you are gone. So when I'm writing, I'm writing on an old desktop, hmm. very old. And why? I was a publisher, I know everything about desktops and Adobe and whatever, Word and whatever. But I'm writing in Word perfect, 5.1 still. <laughs> and many of you have never tried that. But Word perfect 5.1 is the mother of all text programs. This is the program where you can use the shortcuts with your fingers and you can do it five times quicker than anyone using the mouse. And without mistakes, if you're clever in doing that. So I'm writing on a blue screen, white letters in Korea. And why not Times New Roman? Because if you're writing in Times New Roman, you believe it's good. <laughs> but in Korea, you know it's not. So I re-edit and re-edit many, many times. And then when I'm satisfied, I convert it into word, see a new perspective on the text, mm. and when I'm satisfied after re-editing re many times, I'm converting into a dope, making a full printable book, delivering to the publishing house and say, you can find no mistakes at all. <laughs> there I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, this, this is a very, very fine way to, for me to work. Nice. And you also told yourself uh, another time that uh, while writing, you'd like to play music, Ennio Morricone. Yeah, Ennio Morricone and whatever. I mean, Keith Jarrett in the Kölner, Kölner concert. Yes, and it's always... Uh, it, uh, it's always... Without it's words, with text, without text. It is, yes. it is. Instrumental. It's instrumental and it's symphonic very often. I, I take on the headphones and I can sit amongst a lot of people running around. It, I don't care a lot. And then I just write. But, you know, the secret is I only take the best composers, the best musicians, and the best conductors in the world. Uh, Herbert van Kajen, how many times did I listen to his conductions? Because you can feel if they are so clever and the music is so well done, whether you are up there in your writing or not. 
Bernard Heitink. Sorry? Bernard Heitink, Concert Gebouw. Yeah, 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 fantastic. I've been there many times in the Concert Gebouw. But then you have to start all over if, if you're not there. Of course, it's an illusion, but suddenly I feel that we are in, you know, symposis. We, we work well together. And then uh, Herbert van Karen can just play along and I write, you know, and that's it. If I'm becoming deaf, I stop writing. And that's for sure. I can't do without, simply. I can't do without my gadget of the old laptop, my old tastatura of IPM from 1992, saying click, 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 and uh, without an extra uh, monitor. So, but I'm never tired in my eyes, and I have never problem with my neck because of that. I can write 15 hours, no problem. I have to go to pee once, a while. But it's very uh, unconventional. The most writers I know start early, say six o'clock, work till ten, and then get alive. They're crazy. <laughs> so you work work crazy. 15 hours. But no, normally I don't, but no. coming closer and closer to my own deadline. And what's an average day then? An average day doesn't, doesn't exist for okay. me, not at all. Uh, it could be uh, nothing for a month or two. It could be uh, seven hours in a row. It could be normally two hours. And if I, in good mood, two hours mean three pages. That's a lot. But, uh, you know, just not stopping and be totally concentrated, I'm in my inner world. And people very often ask me, and are you going to reflect about your story now with the Q10 when you're going around and shopping and so forth? Never. <laughs> I sit down, open my laptop, yeah. and then I write. It must be fun to create a whole uh, universe of your own. Yes. And, and you know, I, I feel safe then. Hmm. It's only me and the story. So, and of course, it meets a lot of preparations according to the plot, according to who are the main characters. The first book I, I wrote, The Alphabet House, I wrote 80 pages about their childhood, the main characters, which are two pilots in the Second World War. And a, oh, yeah. a friend of mine, he came to me and said, well, it's a fantastic book, but leave out the, the 80 pages about the childhood. We don't need that. St start at, you know, at the airplane field, and that's the story. And I had to agree, but it was three months of work in the drain. But from that, I learned that to know the character from long before my story starts is a big help to oh, yeah. write yeah. and to, to make them have a dialogue that is their dialogue not artificial, but they can't say anything else. I believe in that. The child of Karl Merck living there, he would respond like that after this life. So it's, it's a good trick for me. Yeah, um, since there are so many uh, fans, uh, is there anyone in the audience who would, would like to ask a question? <laughs> you could ask me anything, yeah, do that. Sorry? What will happen after number 10? What's your what's birthday number 10? Yeah, uh, I understand the question too well. Um, I'm not writing any more cues. I'm not. I'm, write, so I'm writing something else maybe. A standalone here and there. Uh, I made the story of the illustrated Chinaman 150 pages 10 years ago. And I am for sure going to make this if I'm still alive, you know. Because in this book, The Standalone, we have the best ever made, and I'm sure of that, the best ever made closed room mystery of all in the whole gang of time literature, you know. So I, I need to, to write that. And then I'm going to write, play guitar and see some football in television and go to Barcelona and see it on Canal. Uh, I'm going to be a good friend of mine, uh, and I'm going to be a, a swell family member. I'm going to renovate a lot of buildings, because this is my hobby. And uh, what else? I don't know. 
try to play a little football again, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I can use some uh, extra help uh, with Barcelona. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yes. But it's a good question, and you know, I thought very much about it because uh, so many publishing houses in the world ask me, could it really be true? For instance, the, 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 the German uh, house, DTV, Deutsche Taschen Verlag, they are telling us that uh, they need the income, simply. I'm a bestseller in, in, in Germany. And uh, of course, uh, it, it makes a big impression on me when they say, how can we do the what we must do according to the foundation of our publishing house, meaning making uh, uh, Schin uh, Schiller and, and you know, Goethe again, reprints of that, because we're using your money on that. And we are using your money on doing arts encyclopedias. Well, my answer was, you know, find another bestseller. I mean, you, you must do that. Don't you have any Dutch which we can fill in? No? No, no. Maybe. Um, is a rose total fictional? The rose? Rose. Um, rose was invented because I knew that the interaction between two persons having a lot of secrets could seem endlessly, but isn't. Suddenly it would be stereotypically. I needed an extra character. I knew that from the beginning. And I would not introduce her in the first book, but in the second comes Rose. And Rose is like anarchy, total yeah. chaos. <laughs> and I needed the chaos power because what's important in the Department Q is that after a few books, we should never know who is actually the boss. And in some books, it's Rose. Very few books, it's Carl. And in many books, it's Assad. So Rose, she was also a person with a lot of secrets. So I had to decide when I am going to reveal the secrets of Rose and Carl and Assad. And I decided the secrets of Rose could be number seven. It's called Selfish. The secrets of Assad is of her 2117. You have them. It was difficult, you know, because she's lying a lot. And I had to put, you know, post it on the wall. Yeah. There he's lying in book number one. And in number two, he's actually telling the truth. And realizing at number eight, that, okay, maybe I thought this was a lie, number one, but it wasn't really. And then I had to make it green instead of red. It took me a month, you know, to, to, to make this mess in order. Green uh, and red? Green, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> green is good, red is the lie. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, uh, Karl Merck. This is uh, some of his secrets here, and more to come in number 10. And Gordon, he's the old man in, right? Gordon, he came later on. Yeah. Gordon, the story about Gordon. When I made the Washington decree, I have a person, the defense minister of the United States, was called Big Lobter. So one of my employees in this comic house was Big Lobter. He was a Polish guy, Grzegorz Big Lobter. And I make him, you know, defense minister in the Washington decree. An other employee I have, and had at that period, he was the son of the mayor of Copenhagen, and he was a little, you know, very tall guy, two meters and six. And uh, he said, one day he said to me, after reading some of the Q series, I have to complain because you made Grzegorz Defense Minister of the United States, but me, <laughs> Elsing is my last name, and I'm an old woman, <laughs> the ex uh, mother in law of uh, Karl Merck, and she's promiscuous. She's using, you know, uh, dildos, uh, 85 years old, and she's stealing and drinking, and how dare you to make me that person? I said, okay, Gordon, then I'll make a Gordon for you here. And I did, I can't remember, it's four or five. Yeah. So I made a flamboyant person, 
always thinking about sex, very high, very, very pale, exactly like he. He's still a little annoyed by, by that. But he's dating all the time, but it doesn't have any success. He doesn't have any success, no. In that's reality, why, that's why he hates you. <laughs> yeah. In reality, he is having much success, but that's another, oh, okay. another thing. Anyone that's cool. Because we could all speak on forever, but maybe you have to sign now because it's 7.15. Oh, come on. Yeah? Maybe another question. Yeah. yeah. You, you, we've now nine, uh, nine parts of this uh, series. And hmm? uh, which one is your favorite? Or is that really My favorite? favorite? <laughs> You know, every book has got a part, which is my favorite. And it would be a mess if I took all the favorites and made one book of those. Crazy, chaos. But uh, when, I, when I decided the themes of all the ten books, number four was a theme about German refugees after the Second World War in Denmark. We treated them so bad. They died, you know, in Denmark. My father, he was responsible for the doctorship in Copenhagen at that time. That meant that if there was a problem, an epidemic or something, he was the one who was called to analyze how big is the problem. One day he came to a school and he was stopped by a police officer. And my father asked, but I heard there was dysentery and typhus in there. It's very, very, I mean, that's important for me to go there. You can't go because uh, Health Ministry of Denmark decided that we are not treating refugees coming from Germany. The refugees were women and children, like now in Ukraine. Losing their husbands, losing their homes, trying to find a paradise in Denmark. We let the 18,000 of those die from diseases in the period from 45 to 48. Revenge it was. And my father, he was like, I hate my own colleagues for that. He could do nothing and he resigned as a head doctor of that after that and became a psychiatrist. So, uh, I wanted to write about those refugees, but there was another author in Denmark, Grete Lise Horten was her name, and she didn't write the same book, of course, but the issue was the same, sort of. So, and I, I, I need to feel myself original, so I decided I'm not, never going to write that book. It could have been, you know, Sophie's choice. That was what I was aiming at, sort of. So instead, every year while we were living in Jutland, we were sailing from Jutland, passing the island of Fyn in the middle of Denmark to the island of Sealand where Copenhagen is and where our family lived. Two times a year, that means four times, we passed the island of Fyn and a smaller island where it was called Sporbury, where they kept women, special women, I can tell you. For a certain period, my father, he was a candidate uh, in a sanatorium where many low intelligent persons, disabled persons, were and treated. And in the period from 1922 and 1961, they took all promiscuous women, and that means only that they fucked around with the wrong persons. Maybe they were a little too open-minded too. Not, not intelligent. And the most bright of those, they claimed that leave me out of this place. How can you treat me like, like this together with the disabled? And if they shouted loud, uh, loud enough, they were placed in the island of Sproer. The island of Sproer had throughout the years from 22 to 68, 8,000 women there. The only way they could come away from this island was to get sterilized, so they were not spreading the bad blood of theirs. 
Every time we passed that island, my father said, this is so shameful. This is the worst. I was 61, I was 11 years old. I could see the women in there. So my father, he died in 1996. And I said, okay, I'll make a tribute to my father and to the women who were there. A tribute to the women still alive. And they were quite old, many of these, those. So they could have the excuse from the state and maybe some compensation. <coughs> it's called Journal 64. Journal 64. So uh, this was due. And uh, this is maybe the best. I don't know. But it's the one who my heart belongs to. Certainly. Long, long, long answer. Man. <laughs> part 10? What about part 10? <laughs> what are you asking? I can't hear you. What the ending will be? <laughs> My ending? Yes, part 10. <laughs> it will be gorgeous. <laughs> you know what? I know what happens in number 10, and I knew it since 2005. So, what I didn't know of was the last sentence. Oh, yeah. And I reflected for many, many years, how can it be fantastic? So three or four years ago, I woke up in my summer house in the northern part of Zealand with a sentence in my head. And I was like, ah, I'm a genius. <laughs> so that's how I end. <clears throat> You're welcome. And what was important for me was that you have circular feeling from the very first start in number one until the very last sentence, and it makes sense. Number 10 is, of course, a secret. And I know that, have some of you read this number nine? No, no? it's just been published this week. Oh, yeah, you feel, I can tell you the VN thing now. I can tell you, don't read the last sentence. Oh, yeah. Because if you do, you can commit suicide on the spot. That would be so naughty. Of course, it turns until number 10. Certainly it does. More than ever before. Now you know in the last sentence what could happen in number 10. Go, go, go. <laughs> okay, now I think it's time for me to greet. Eh? Oh, yes. Yeah. Can I eat this now? Uh, uh, if there are any more questions, you can say hello and let your book sign. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, thank you so far. Thank you for coming. It was and, a joy. Uh, it's very interesting. But John Grissom, famous John Grissom, always starts his book with the last sentence. Maybe it's a Good advice for you too. You know, I like John Grissom very much. But he is not a thriller writer, really. He's not a? Not a thriller writer. He's a preacher. You know why? In a specific chapter, you can jump from the head to, of Rob to mine, like this. Now he said and was thinking, oh no, the other guy said. He was thinking the opposite. That means. You can never make point of views. It will be very short point of views. And what does a point of view mean? If you have read me, you know, one chapter, one person. I'm writing a chapter about Karl Merck, and in the next chapter, it's maybe the villain, and you are unhappy about that. You can't leave here now. Yes. And in the end of the next chapter, you're feeling the same. Now you don't stop here. Now a new person. Yeah. With the per point of views, you can make the reader know something about the main character that the main character doesn't know himself. Oh, are you going to open this door here? Mm -hmm. But he's standing on the other side, I read in the former chapter with a hammer. Don't open the door. This is suspense. Suspense and point of views is very important, and you can't make suspense without the point of views. So the kind of point of views of John Grissom is, he 
because he's such a clever writer and he knows something about law and justice and courtrooms. What will happen in a true courtroom? Or will he be sentenced to death and actually die? It's also a kind of cliffhanger, but it's not a filler. It's a good story. That's it. Do you know the, the term um, uh, suspension of disbelief? Oh yeah, I know it. And what about it? Well, what does it mean for you? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> no, but you know, I use any trick I can. Yeah. I use any trick. And, uh, you know, if I must make a chapter of two pages only, to make you confused, I do that. If I need to explain something about the childhood of a specific person in two pages, I do that. If I don't want to tell you only the half of the person's life, I do that. It's all about cheating you, manipulate you, and to make you cooperate with me in reading. That makes the fun of me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and as Rob tells, I will sign books yep. for you if you want to. Yes, please. Now we can turn this off.